Hey everyone, it's Dylan. I am standing here at 1200 Fifth Avenue in downtown Seattle at the corner of Fifth and University. This is the former site of the Seattle Ice Arena, which was the home arena for the Seattle Metropolitan, Seattle's first professional hockey team and the first American-based team to ever win the Stanley Cup. Now, a couple years ago when we started the Emerald City Hockey Channel, one of the first videos that I uploaded was a documentary about the Seattle Metropolitans and got great feedback on it at the time, but the channel has grown a lot since then. And with the Winter Classic around the corner and all of the world's hockey eyes on the city of Seattle and its hockey history, this seemed like the perfect time to re-release that documentary as one complete edition that tells the entire history of the Seattle Metropolitan's franchise in time for the Winter Classic on January 1st. I hope you all enjoy it. Professional hockey has been in the city of Seattle for over a hundred years, and it started when the Seattle Metropolitans joined the Pacific Coast Hockey Association in 1915. The PCHA was a startup West Coast League founded by Frank and Lester Patrick, yes, that Lester Patrick, with some financial help from their father Joe. The former hockey playing brothers quickly made the PCHA a destination league for players looking for better financial situations than those that existed in the National Hockey Association, the league that would become the NHL. What ensued after the PCHA's formation was nothing short of a talent war, as each offseason was filled with players bouncing back and forth between the two leagues. After the Ottawa Senators tried to poach one of the PCHA's best players, Cyclone Taylor of the Vancouver Millionaires, the Patrick brothers responded by signing away five players from the Toronto Blue Shirts, the reigning Stanley Cup champions, and giving them to their newest expansion club in Seattle. Playing in the Seattle arena, the Metropolitans, or the Mets as they were often called, finished their inaugural season with a respectable, though a tad bit disappointing, 500 record, going 9-9. That said, they were 7-3 playing in the Seattle arena, and this helped them draw sizable crowds of around 2,500 fans, and proved that Seattle was a viable market for a hockey team. They were led in scoring by surprise player Bernie Morris, who they had signed to a tryout contract after he had been a reserve player for the victorious Senators the previous two seasons. He scored 23 goals and netted 9 assists for a total of 32 points in the Mets' 18-game schedule. The following season, however, things really took off for the Metropolitans. Head coach and general manager Pete Muldoon pushed the team toward a more skilled and athletic style of play that suited their stars. With this change, the Metropolitans finished the 1916-1917 season 16-8 and, and clinched their first PCHA championship. Once again, Bernie Morris led the team in goals and points with 37 goals and 54 points, but this time he had help in the form of Frank Foyston, who netted 36 goals and 48 points in the Mets' new high-flying skill game. Now, back in 1915, an agreement was reached whereupon the winners of the Pacific Coast Hockey Association and the winner of the National Hockey Association would play each other for the Stanley Cup. As the PCHA's champion in 1917, that meant that Seattle was going to face the NHA champion, the previous season Stanley Cup champion, the Montreal Canadiens. The best of five series was to be played in Seattle, the first time the Stanley Cup Finals had ever been played on US soil, with games 1, 3, and 5 played under PCH rules. This included playing with seven players on the ice. Games 2 and 4 were to be played under NHA rules, with six players, like the NHL is played with now. On March 17th, the Montreal Canadiens took Game 1 with a score of 8-4, to four, despite only arriving in Seattle earlier that morning. The Mets' athletic stars seemed unprepared for the larger, more bruising Eastern team. This proved to be just a minor bump in the road for the Mets, however, as they adjusted and came back to take Game 2 with a score of 6-1. to one. Frank Foyston completed a hat trick in the third period after an opening period brawl. The Habs were down 4 0 and had grown frustrated. And if not for a late goal with only a few moments left, the NHA champion Canadians would have been shut out. As Game 3 started, the Mets tried to pick up where they left off. Bernie Morris scored 10 minutes in to give the Metropolitans an early lead. 
However, Canadian's goaltender and future Hockey Hall of Famer George Vesna, yes, that one, stood on his head and the game remained 1-0 headed into the third period. However, Vesna could only do so much for so long as Frank Foyston scored five minutes into the period and Morris added two more goals to complete his hat trick. By the end, Seattle had taken lead of the series after winning 4-1. Seattle goaltender Hap Holmes once again lost his shutout bid late into the third period. Quickly into the start of Game 4, it was clear that Seattle smelled blood in the water. Bernie Morris once again started the scoring for the Mets and from there, the floodgates opened. Winning by a score of 9-1, the Metropolitans became the first American-based team to win the Stanley Cup. As you may have guessed, they were led by Bernie Morris's staggering 14 goals in four games, which made even Frank Foyston's seven goals seem paltry in comparison. Goaltender Hap Holmes, after finishing yet another game in which his only goal allowed was in the final frame, secured his second career Stanley Cup victory. After the game, the Seattle Post Intelligencer summed it up nicely, writing, Seattle's valiant hockey team put the climax on a successful ice revolution at the arena last night, kicked the props from under the tottering Canadian dynasty, and climbed roughshod over the fallen monarchs to the place of power as hockey's champions of the universe. The new hockey champions of the universe enjoyed much in the way of celebration at the annual PCHA award ceremony as well. Despite setting a PCHA record with 54 points, a record that would never be broken, Bernie Morris lost the MVP race to teammate Frank Foyston. Both men were selected to both all PCHA teams, with Jack Walker joining them on the team voted on by members of the league, and goaltender Hap Holmes joining them on the team voted on by members of the media. The Metropolitan's title defense started not with a bang, but a whimper. World War I was in full swing, and this greatly impacted the lives of everyone in North America. For the Seattle Metropolitans, the impact of the war was profound. Three players were drafted into the Canadian military, including the previous season's MVP Frank Foyston, All-Star Jack Walker, and defenseman Eddie Carpenter. As if those losses weren't enough, manager coach Pete Muldoon, the man responsible for both building the excellent Seattle roster, as well as instituting their fast and athletic play style, was asked by the Patrick brothers to head south and helm the Portland Rosebuds, the team he had coached prior to joining Seattle. Finally, rounding out their losses, goaltender and reigning all-star Hap Holmes was a free agent and chose to sign with the Montreal Wanderers. There was a moment of brief hope when Montreal loaned him back to Seattle, but Seattle, now under the leadership of player-manager coach Lester Patrick, chose in turn to loan him to the Toronto Torontos shortly before the season began. Seattle limped out of the starting block with a 2-3 record, including two losses to Pete Muldoon's Portland Rosebuds. However, finally, good news was on the horizon. Frank Foyston returned to the lineup after his draft status was rescinded. Fellow draftees Jack Walker and Eddie Carpenter were not so fortunate and ended up serving as dry dock workers in Port Arthur, Ontario for the whole season. With Foyston back in the lineup, Seattle finished the season with a PCHA best 11-7 record and went on to face the Vancouver Millionaires in the first round of the newly minted PCHA playoffs. This would consist of a two-game total goal series, where the winning team would be whomever scored more total goals over the course of the series. After Game 1 ended in a 2-2 tie, Vancouver was able to upset and win Game 2 1-0, taking the series and heading east to play Hap Holmes and the Toronto Torontos for the Stanley Cup, a series they would lose. The next offseason, however, was one of returning to normalcy. Jack Walker and Eddie Carpenter returned from their service. Pete Muldoon came back as manager and coach. His first move? Ending Seattle's loan of Hap Holmes to Toronto and bringing the goaltender back to the West Coast. Armed with the roster that had won the Stanley Cup only two seasons ago, the Metropolitans finished 11-9 and once again were set to face the Vancouver Millionaires in the PCHA title series. After winning handedly in Game 1 by a score of 6-1, the team was shocked when leading scorer and spiritual leader of the team Bernie Morris was apprehended by the U.S. military authorities hours before Game 2 began on the charge of draft dodging. 
After a plea from Coach Muldoon, Bernie was allowed to play before they took him into custody. Despite this minor victory, the team was still shaken by the news and lost Game 2 by a score of 4-1. to one. Despite the loss, however, they won the series with a 7-5 to five goals margin and once again were champions of the PCHA, and were bound for a Stanley Cup rematch with the team they had defeated two seasons prior, the Montreal Canadiens. What followed was a series that was described by PCHA President Frank Patrick as the most peculiar series in the history of the sport. Despite being a Canadian citizen, Bernie Morris had been drafted into the U.S. Armed Forces on account of his living and playing in America, but had been granted an exemption. This exemption had been revoked on November 5, 1918, six days before the war was ended. Morris claimed that he did not know that his status had been changed as he had been working at a lumber mill in British Columbia during the off-season when it occurred. He was set for a later trial, but remained in custody where both he and Mets coach Pete Muldoon hoped to have him released at some point during the cup finals. Despite losing their leading scorer, Seattle took Game 1 with a score of 7 to nothing, powered by a Frank Foiston hat trick. After adjusting to the warmer Seattle climate and the unusual experience of walking on cement sidewalk, an actual excuse the manager of the Canadiens, George Kennedy, used at the time, Montreal won Game 2 with a score of 4-2 thanks to a four-goal performance by player coach Nuzi Lalonde. After the game, Seattle received the news that they had been fearing. Bernie Morris was going to be detained for several more weeks, meaning he would miss the remainder of the series. With the grim news solidified, Seattle once again was going to need someone to step up and fill the void of their leading scorer, and once again, Frank Foiston was more than happy to oblige. Through the first period of Game 3, Foiston had three goals, with a fourth tacked on at the end of a 7-2 Seattle victory. After the game, he received a letter from Bernie Morris. Morris wrote that he was with the team in spirit, and that he was sure they would win the Stanley Cup. With only one win to go, Seattle thought the same as they headed into Game 4. That was the hardest game of hockey ever played. That was the quote from Frank Patrick after Game 4 ended after 80 grueling minutes of scoreless hockey. Despite both teams scoring a combined 22 goals over the previous three games, Hap Holmes and George Vesna decided that tonight would be the night that they would do battle. Even without the shots on goal numbers available, we know both men had their work cut out for them. Reporters at the time spoke of the back and forth play each team had, with close chances for each team coming within moments of each other. At one point, Seattle thought they had a goal, only to have it waved off as the period had ended a second prior. In addition to this, without Morris, Seattle was forced to play the PCHA ruled game with every single member of their team for the entire 80 minutes. Despite playing with a level of resolve and stamina the sport would never see again, Seattle was forced to end the game in a tie after players on both sides collapsed, sprawled out on the ice exhausted, and it was agreed that they could not continue. It was the last time a Stanley Cup final game would end in a tie. With their two days off, the Mets did their best to rest and recover after the feat of endurance they had shown the previous game, and two periods into Game 5, it looked like they had. Taking a 3-0 lead into the third period, Seattle was once again using their speed to tire the bigger Canadian team out. But with so many miles already on their bodies this series, Seattle blew their lead, allowing Montreal to tie the game and send it to overtime. In overtime, Frank Foiston aggravated a thigh injury he had received in the previous contest and was unable to continue. Then. Fate and mental mistakes came for the Seattle Metropolitans when Jack Walker's skate broke at the same time as Seattle was undergoing an ill-timed line change, as Cully Wilson was trying to leave the ice before collapsing from exhaustion. This left Montreal with a golden opportunity to end the game, and they capitalized with a Jack McDonald goal. With the series tied at two games apiece, a final sixth game was going to be needed to determine the fate of the Stanley Cup. However, no such game would take place. After such grueling back-to-back -back games, Seattle had been besieged by injuries and fatigue. 
Frank Foyston was diagnosed with a torn tendon, defenseman Bobby Rowe had an ankle that could barely support any weight, and his partner Roy Rickley had lost 10 pounds after having played the last 155 minutes of the series non-stop. Montreal had even larger concerns, however. The influenza pandemic had been ravaging the world for a little over a year by the time the series had began. During the two-year course of the pandemic, roughly one in three people were infected worldwide, and hockey was not immune. Five Canadians players grew sick after Game 5 and had to remain in their hotel rooms. This meant Game 6 was postponed until players were healthy enough to continue. Montreal manager George Kennedy offered to forfeit, as his squad could not ice a team, but Metropolitan's manager coach Pete Muldoon refused the cup, citing the catastrophic nature of the circumstances. Kennedy then made a play to try and use players from the PCHA Victoria Aristocrats, but PCHA president Frank Patrick refused the request. Four days after Game 6 was to be played, Canadian's utility player Joe Hall passed away at the age of 37. The series was cancelled, with the result a tie, as neither team won the Cup. It was, and still remains, the only time the Stanley Cup has not been awarded. A few weeks later, Bernie Morris was sent to serve time at the famed Alcatraz Federal Prison, where he was sentenced to two years of hard labor. The following season, Seattle once again made the PCHA playoffs with a 12-10 record, and again beat Vancouver to advance to the Stanley Cup Finals. Because it was an even year, this meant the NHL would be hosting the finals on the East Coast. However, given the previous year's cup had been cancelled, the PCHA fought to have it played in Seattle again, or at a neutral site such as Winnipeg. Their efforts were rebuked, and after nearly a month of debate, Seattle packed their bags and headed east. However, there was reason for celebration before the first game was played, as Bernie Morris was exonerated, his charges dismissed, his sentence ended, and he was granted an honorable discharge from the U.S. Armed Forces. This meant he would join the team as they went to Ottawa to take on the Senators. With the series starting later in March than normal thanks to all the debate on where it should take place, the weather quickly became an issue. All through the series, the natural ice surface at the Ottawa Arena was plagued with pools of melted ice and was often soft and sludgy. This greatly affected the Mets' fast, athletic style of game, and they lost games 1 and 2 by a combined score of 6-2. to two. Seattle was able to reverse the trend in Game 3, winning 3-1, three despite the rough ice conditions, however. After the game, officials from both teams met with officials from both leagues, and it was agreed to move the series to Toronto. There, it would be played at the Mutual Street Arena, for it had an artificial ice surface. Finally, playing on a surface that was optimal, Seattle was able to look like the team that had dominated the PCHA for years. Winning 5-2, Seattle went into the deciding Game 5 with all the confidence in the world. Confidence that would kick off the scoring as Bobby Rowe scored 10 minutes into the game to give them an early lead. This lead was later erased in the second by Ottawa, meaning the 1920 Stanley Cup was going to be decided in the final 20 minutes of Game 5. Those 20 minutes couldn't have gone much worse for Seattle, as they surrendered five unanswered goals to lose the game 6-1 and thus the series. This would prove to be the last time the Metropolitans would be near the top of the hockey world. The following season, they lost to Vancouver in the PCHA playoffs, a history that would be repeated again the following season in 1922. In the 1922-23 season, Seattle failed to make the playoffs for the first time in their history. And finally, in the 1923-24 season, be the last time the Seattle Metropolitans would play professional hockey, losing in the playoffs once again. Over the course of their nine seasons, the Metropolitans won five regular season titles and would end with a combined record of 112 wins, 96 losses, and two ties. This was bolstered by their impressive 73-30 record in the Seattle arena, which, after the team disbanded, was turned into a parking garage. Most importantly, however, was the three Stanley Cup finals the team made in four seasons, and without the interference of a world war, a global pandemic, and the heat of the sun, Seattle might have seen itself home to one of hockey's greatest dynasties. Hey everyone, for a quick epilogue, I thought it would be nice to add these screenshots of the individual season and all-time stats leaders for the Metropolitan's nine-season history. 
In addition, I'd like to add that five members of the Metropolitans ended up in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Frank Foyston, Harry Hap Holmes, John Philip Walker, aka Jack Walker, Lester Patrick, and Gordon Doc Roberts are all immortalized at the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, Canada.